What's behind the complex deal between Iran and the U.S.? Tehran will release American prisoners in exchange for Iranian citizens detained in the U.S. and access to billions in frozen funds. Could that pave the way for the revival of the nuclear deal? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Cyril Vanier. Months of indirect negotiations between bitter enemies, the U.S. and Iran, have culminated in a complex agreement that includes a prisoner exchange. Five Americans detained in Tehran have already been moved to house arrest, and in time, a number of Iranians jailed in the U.S. will be freed. Perhaps most significant is the release of billions of dollars in frozen Iranian assets. U.S. sanctions remain in place, and mistrust is still an issue for both parties, but the deal is being described as a significant political achievement, and some analysts suggest it could lay the groundwork for revisiting the 2015 nuclear accord. So, will this agreement lead to another one? And with the 2024 U.S. presidential election around the corner, will it begin to change America's relationship with its longtime foe? We'll explore these questions with our guests in a moment. First, though, this report by Katya lopez Horian. A deal between longtime adversaries. The U.S. and Iran have taken the first steps in a prisoner exchange deal, a rare but significant agreement. Tehran will release five imprisoned American citizens, while Washington will free several jailed Iranians and unfreeze about $6 billion in Iranian assets. Um, Iran's own funds uh, would be used uh, and transferred to restricted accounts such that the monies can only be used for humanitarian purposes, which, as you know, is permitted under our sanctions. The deal was reached despite heightened tensions between Tehran and Washington, particularly in the Gulf region. The U.S. has deployed thousands of troops to monitor shipping lanes and deter what it describes as harassment from Tehran. Other disputes include Iran's support for Russia in the war in Ukraine, sanctions, and proxy conflicts in Yemen. The symbolism is, is clear, which is that Iran was able to get its money back, its own money. Um, it was a, it's been able to trust important countries in the region, especially Qatar and Oman. And it's, it's doing a bit of a dance using its leverage between the United States and other major powers like Russia and China. Now there's speculation that the prisoner exchange deal could revive negotiations on the 2015 nuclear deal. For now, the White House says it's not a priority. We are not in talks with Iran uh, on the return to the JCPOA, the nuclear deal. Uh, that's, that's not on the agenda right now. Under that landmark deal, Tehran agreed to limit its nuclear development program in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. But in 2018, former President Donald Trump withdrew the U.S. from the agreement and reinstated sanctions. Relations have been strained since, and mistrust remains. The U.S. has never negotiated with Iran based on trust, and the signing of the Iran nuclear deal is not a product of trust. The Iran nuclear deal will only be revived when the U.S. is ready to return to the deal responsibly and assure Iran that it will abide by the agreement seriously. U.S. President Joe Biden has expressed interest in renewing the deal. But that could pose a fresh set of challenges for both sides, particularly ahead of next year's U.S. elections. Katia lopez Odoyan for Inside Story. Okay, let's get to our guests. In Tehran is Fouad Izadi, head of American studies at the University of Tehran. You specialize in U.S.-Iran relations. In Washington, D.C. is Nigar Murtazavi, an Iranian-American journalist, host of the Iran podcast. And in Birmingham in the U.K., we are joined by Scott Lucas, a professor of U.S. and international politics at University College Dublin and editor of EA Worldview, an online news site. So a warm welcome to all of you. Fouad, I want to start with you. What was the first thing you thought when you heard of this deal, when you heard that it had come together? 
You know, the deal was supposed to happen a few months ago. And uh, it was about time, I think. Uh, last time this was supposed to happen, United States decided, the Biden administration decided not to go through with it for different reasons. We can analyze why it didn't happen last time. Uh, but I'm happy that it happened. We have a number of families, uh, five uh, in Iran, five in the United States, that are quite happy. They are going to get their loved ones uh, back. Uh, Iranians are going to get some of the money that belonged to them uh, back. Uh, and uh, countries like South Korea and Iraq, especially Iraq, that were facing difficulties paying Iran back for the things they got from Iran, are going to be able to clear those accounts, I think, beside Iranians and uh, those Americans, I think we have those two countries that are also happy to see this uh, deal go through. Nagar, why did this deal happen now, then? Well, the negotiations had been in the making for quite some time, even um, the past couple of years. This was one of the priorities for the Biden administration to um, at least get the prisoners, the American prisoners, home. But we know when uh, diplomacy started between Tehran and Washington with this administration, at the beginning, there was a few months of overlap with the previous administration in Tehran. Then they hit the election season in Iran. New administration came who was more reluctant to do outreach with the United States. There have been instances when we hear from either side that the deal was close, including last year around the same time, August when families um, were feeling or getting signals that a deal is imminent and then it didn't happen. There seems to be a blame game going on by both sides, each blaming the other for preventing this from happening, each suggesting that this was a priority for them. They wanted it to happen. Um, but, but we are where we are. It was complicated. It is a complicated deal when we look at the mechanism and the logistics of how many countries and parties and so many moving parts are involved. To this day, the American prisoners are not free. They are in a hotel room, each separate hotel rooms in Tehran. Um, and so it's in the making. But it did happen. It was a priority for both sides. And again, as your guest also said, um, families and loved ones and the prisoners themselves who had been uh, going through this very difficult ordeal for many years, some of them um, are finally going to be reunited. You're right that it is complicated, the mechanism of the deal. We'll get to that in just a second. But first, I want to bring in Scott with this question. You know, Scott, when we see any deal between two conflicting parties, you, you can't help but wonder, well, what's in it for each side? And on a surface level, this one's pretty simple, right? Both countries get detained, get nationals back that were detained in the other country. And for Iran, it's even clearer what they get from it. They get billions of dollars that they badly need. Is there, that's the surface level reading of it. Is there something else? Is there something perhaps we're missing from that reading? Well, I think that's the immediate reading, but we need a bit of context. Um, I think it's important to note that the reason why this deal did not happen a few months ago, despite being negotiated for a couple of years, was, and we need to be honest here and forthright, it's because Iran took another American hostage, uh, one of those five who was released yesterday, who was recently seized. Now, whether that was a particular branch of the Iranian government, like the Revolutionary Guards going off script and seizing someone, whether Iran was trying to get more leverage, we're not sure. But it does highlight the two, as it were, intertwined factors here. For the Biden administration, they want to get some, they don't want the, the talks about Iran's nuclear program to just stagnate and fade away, because otherwise you will have the risk of confrontation hanging not, not, over, uh, hanging not only over Iran, but over the region. So to get the prisoner release, it was sort of a de-escalation step that says perhaps you can open the door to now not get an immediate settlement on the nuclear issue, but at least to begin to reopen the talks. From the Iranian side, it's simply the economic crisis. I mean, let's just be blunt about it. Uh, Iran's currency almost halved in value since last September. Now, it's been stabilized to an extent by the central bank, but inflation is still high. Officially, it's 40 percent. Unofficially, it's much higher on official items. You have serious problems with production and infrastructure that are going on in the country. And of course, you have the overlay of the nationwide protests since last September. 
So Iran cannot continue to hold up completely and just say, great Satan, great Satan. At some point, they needed to try to strike a deal, especially because Iran's play a few months ago was, look, we'll normalize with Saudi Arabia, we'll normalize with the Arab world. We don't have to necessarily look to the Americans if that works. But Saudi Arabia has tacked back. There are further talks with the Israelis. In other words, the kaleidoscope of Middle Eastern politics meant mm. Iran could not simply turn its back on some form of negotiation with the Americans. Fouad, is this the result of what some people call hostage diplomacy on the part of Iran, which is the notion that Iran, the country, Iran, the government, will uh, imprison American nationals, and sometimes you see it with British nationals or other nationalities as well, and then use them as bargaining chips to obtain something. Is that what we're looking at? You know, there are a few facts that uh, I think we can uh, be certain about. The first fact is that uh, this year is the 70th anniversary of the 1953 coup. Uh, we know that the CIA orga organized that coup, orchestrated that coup. And we know that there were Iranians that were working for the CIA that helped the CIA to be able to go through that coup d'etat. Uh, that's a fact. We know that Americans have spies in other countries. Uh, I, I, I don't think there is any country in the world that is not uh, hosting a, a number of American spies. Uh, some of them are probably watching your program right now. And we know that the United States has hostile policies towards Iran. Uh, I don't know if the people who are in prison or are in the hotel rooms right now, I don't know if they're spies or not. But I know that the CIA has been focusing on Iran and Russia and China for many years. And they do have assets and spies in these countries. But, but now, so respectfully, uh, you're not quite answering my question, Fouad. And Scott, I see you shaking your head. I'll get to you in a second. So the, the question is, and you know what critics of the Iranian government say, right? They say Iran deliberately captures and jails people that they can then use as bargaining chips. That's what hostage diplomacy is, it refers to. Do you Iran agree that Iran does this or disagree? I agree that Iran wants to make sure that uh, we don't have an, another American coup, like we had 70 years ago in Tehran. Uh, we know that uh, we have five Iranians that are sitting in American jails, mm -hmm. uh, generally uh, victims of uh, FBI fishing expeditions, uh, accused of violating sanctions that are illegal under international law. So if you call the people who are in hotel rooms in Iran hostages, why can't we call those Iranians sitting in American jail hostages? You know, the freedom fighter of one side is the terrorist of the other side. So we can play with these terminologies. We can demonize the Iranian government. The Western media outlets are very good at that. But that's not going to resolve anything. Uh, Scott, I think I suspect you might have a few things to say about that. Uh, look, I, um, I'm an analyst, and as analyst here, I think we have to be respectful in terms of what is happening and not play diversions regarding these people who are held as political prisoners. First of all, there is a history of CIA intervention in various countries around the world, including Iran. Indeed, the 70th anniversary of the coup that was backed by the CIA, Britain's MI6, is occurring this week. But you don't use 70 years ago to try to justify taking innocent people and throwing them into detentions for a year. Iran has never presented any evidence against Sia Maknamazi, the oil executive who was seized in November 2015 and who now may finally be released. They never produced any evidence against his father, Babak, a UN staffer who was in his 70s when he was in prison for years. They never presented any evidence publicly against Imad Shargi, the businessman who might now, now finally be released. They have not presented evidence against other foreign nationals who are still being held in Iranian prisons. So let us be honest here. Yes, political prisoners were taken. And no, it is not the same as the Iranians that were in prison in the United States who may be in this deal. We can criticize the fact that these Iranians were jailed, imprisoned, convicted over sanctions violations by questioning whether the sanctions were justified. But those people receive due process in an American court in a transparent way. And the people who are in Iranian prisons who were held as 
pawns, whether it be for the release of money, the lifting of sanctions, or some type of uh, advantage in the nuclear negotiations, they were taken as innocent people who had no connection with the U.S. intelligence service. Nagar, when you see Iranians, um, the Iranian government releasing American nationals that they had charged with either spying, espionage, um, I mean, it's all pretty similar when, when you look at the charges. Um, what does that tell you? Does that suggest that American economic sanctions worked because they forced Iran's hand? Or what does it tell you? I don't think the U.S. policy, especially economic sanctions, broad economic sanctions, is something that has worked per se. I mean, it depends on how you define work, Israel. It sure. has put a lot of pressure on ordinary Iranians, on the lives of uh, ordinary Iranians, but has it really brought policy change big policy change domestically, regionally? Has it changed Iran's presence in the region? Has it changed Iran's outlook towards the West, United States, Europe? Has it changed Iran's position vis-a-vis -vis Russia's attack on Ukraine? Not really. I mean, this is, this is an important deal, but we have to remember this is a small deal. This is just a, I see it as a limited action, a prisoner swap, uh, a, an exchange of a few prisoners on one side and the other. And then unblocking of frozen assets. The U.S. is not, in fact, changing any policy when it comes to actual economic sanctions. The funds will be transferred to Qatar and will only be used for non-sanctioned uh, right. payments. So food and medication. Food and medicine, which is already allowed, which is already allowed under U.S. law. So U.S. is not changing policy. Iran is not changing policy. Yes, a humanitarian gesture has happened. It can also be seen and uh, used as a goodwill gesture for both sides. I'm hoping this would be a prelude to more understandings and more agreement and moving away from a brewing conflict, which uh, we see between the two sides, uh, more de-escalation when it comes to Iran's nuclear program, U.S. Mm. posturing towards the country. But this is just a first step. And going back to your question, I don't think the policy of maximum pressures that started by the previous administration and then that continuation of these crippling economic sanctions has achieved any major policy goals except for bringing more misery to ordinary Iranians. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. Um, Fawad, before we completely move on from this, from that topic, um, what Nagar was mentioning earlier on the, the, the mechanism of the deal, can you please briefly run us through how this all works, especially the path that the money is going to have to take, because I think a lot of our viewers will say, oh, well, easy, you know, you just swap prisoners, swap prisoners, release money, press on a button, it's done. Then when you start reading, <laughs> reading the details, it's actually a lot more complicated. And even powerful countries, whether it's the U.S., whether it's mediators, find it hard to get something like this done. It takes time. You know, it shouldn't be that complicated, because the Americans uh, claim that food and medicine is exempt uh, from sanctions. So if food and medicine is exempt from sanctions, Iran should be able to get the dollars that are deposited in South Korean banks and Iraqi banks and buy food and medicine with those dollars. It shouldn't be that complicated. It shouldn't be transferring these monies to Switzerland well, and then So explain the financial circuit to us, please. Explain the financial circuit, because right now we're talking about money that is mostly in South Korean banks, in South Korean currency, and then it's got to end up through a series of permutations. It's got to end up in, in euros or dollars in a Qatari account. Just explain the process to us. You know, Iran sold uh, oil to South Korea in dollars. So the money, initially at least, was in dollars. The reason they have to transfer, you know, change that money into South Korean funds and then take it to Switzerland and then take it to Qatar is the fact that the United States is lying about its sanctions policies. The U.S. claims that food and medicine is exempt. But the major problem is that the banking sanctions don't allow Iran to use dollars to be able to buy food and medicine. So they have to transfer that money to different currencies, different banks, and all the complications that we have. And Scott, 
knowing this very fact that the United States is punishing Iranian people with food and medicine, a country of over 85 million people, is expecting us to trust the judicial system in the United States and demonize the judicial system in Iran. The evidence of what these people did was presented to a judge in Iran. And a judge in Iran is no less or no more uh, good as a judge in the United States. And if, if you don't accept that, then you are engaging in Orientalism. And I think Scott knows what Orientalism is. Uh, I think a number of our viewers do as well. Scott, right of, right of response. Okay. First of all, stop it with the diversions like Orientalism and that everybody and that somehow everybody's biased. If you have people that you're holding in your prisons who haven't gotten a fair hearing, now let me actually answer the question regarding what is being done under this agreement regarding the money that Iran is getting. As you pointed out, it is being converted into euros and it's being put into Qatari financial institutions to be an overseen by the Qatari government, according to those who are close to the negotiations. And that means that Iran cannot freely take out that money to use it on any item that it wishes to purchase, that it wishes to invest in. It has to be, for as Nagar pointed out, non-sanctioned items like food and medicine, humanitarian aid. The reason for that is, is that the U.S. feared that if it gave Iran an open-ended access to these assets, before getting a reduction of the nuclear program, Iran could use the money, for example, for military activities. They could use it for the Revolutionary Guards. They could use it for other purposes rather than humanitarian action. Now, you may agree or disagree with that, but that's the mechanism that's in place. What's interesting here is, is that while the central bank governor has acknowledged that that's the arrangement, one of uh, Mr. Azadi's uh, colleagues, Dr. Rondi, from the University of Tehran, who's a de facto English language spokesman for the leadership, is actually denying that arrangement. He's saying that Iran has unfettered access All right. to any of the funds under this agreement. So there's a contradictory message going on even now between Iran's spokespeople as to what exactly the money is and how it will be handled, even though it's pretty clear on the Western side what the arrangements are. There's one really key thing I need to get into, and we have just a few minutes left. Nigar, you can help us with this. Um, anything that happens between Iran and the U.S., you know, the headline question, really, for anyone watching the news is, well, where does this leave us in terms of reviving the nuclear deal? Does it get us closer to a new nuclear deal? Does it get us further away? Where are we on that sliding scale? Your answer. Well, I think the Biden administration is too close to election season for a nuclear deal, quote unquote, at this point. But a nuclear understanding may be something that can be in the horizon after this understanding or this agreement, uh, more of a nuclear de-escalation. It's something that we know the administration has been pursuing um, as part of their uh, negotiations with Iran to try to convince Iran to de-escalate or um, halt or pause uh, the, the expansion of the nuclear program in exchange for uh, what the United States can offer in terms of sanctions relief or uh, the lesser imposition of future sanctions or um, the, the less enforcement of current sanctions. I don't know if that's something that's a possibility. Mm. The past two, three years have proven very, very difficult, at least for this administration in this time, uh, and the administration in Tehran to come uh, to arrive at what I see again as a limited understanding. It took yeah. them three years to arrive to where they are, and that nuclear file is even more complicated. But I think this is a first step, a goodwill gesture that could um, open doors. And I know the Biden administration for a fact that they're not looking for a war per se or a conflict with Iran. Now, whether you sleepwalk into a conflict is a different story. Whether the conflict is brewing without you really wanting it is a different story. And the lack of diplomacy usually leads to more conflict and more tension. So more understandings and more diplomatic engagements uh, and agreements would would um, move them away from a brewing conflict. For uh, building on that point, do you see this, and, and, and Nagar was making the point that this is a pretty narrow deal, right, on a pretty narrow set of issues. 
do you see this as potentially baby steps building towards a bigger agreement between the U.S. and Iran? You know, it could. The Biden administration could return to the nuclear agreement on the first day of the Biden presidency, the same way he returned to the agreement uh, on the climate accord, Paris climate accords. In the U.S. Uh, political system, the new president can nullify executive orders of the previous president, and Biden could do that with the executive order that Trump had with regard to the nuclear agreement. But he refused to do that. He ref he's refusing to return to the agreement two and a half years after his presidency. And uh, John Kirby, the National Security uh, Council spokesman, is saying yesterday that they are not going to negotiate. They are, left, they are leaving the negotiating table when it comes to the nuclear agreement. Mm. And the sanctions that we are talking about are illegal because under U.N. Resolution 2231, all these sanctions were supposed to go away. And with Trump leaving the agreement, the United States brought these sanctions back. And uh, this whole program that we have today, we shouldn't have, because uh, the, these sanctions were not supposed to be there. The United States is punishing South countries like South Korea and Iraq uh, for uh, engaging economically with Iran, violating U.N. Resolution 2231. And the United States is a permanent member of the Security Council. They're not only violating the U.N. Resolution, they're punishing other countries that okay. are trying to follow U.N. resolutions. And for someone in United Kingdom to sit and defend U.S. foreign policy in this manner is an indication that uh, human rights issues is not a concern if someone was really interested in human rights issues, that that person would be interested in human rights of 85 million Iranians. All right. Well, um, we're going to have to wrap it up here. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. But I'd like to thank all our guests for joining us today. Fawadi Zadi, Nigar Murtazavi, and Scott Lucas, thank you all for being with us. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website. That's aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Cyril Vanier, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.